and we're live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, and demystify Bible prophecy and we apply it. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and this is my brother, Don DeCuna, and we're honored to be facilitating the study of Bible prophecy. Ultimately, this is a study of the Bible, specifically prophecy. And we have more recently started studying the book of Revelation. And we talked a little bit about the churches. And then we talked a little, we kind of introduced the whole concept of the seals. And last time we talked, started talking about the trumpets, which was the whole topic of God's judgment. And I think that a lot of times people think of God's judgment as something that is scary. And the truth of the matter is, is that God's judgment, is it scary? It depends on which side you're on. Right. If you're on on his side, right, you're you have nothing to worry about, right? Because his judgment is in your favor. However, if you choose not to be on his side, he's just giving fair warning, which I think is so incredibly generous, right? And so that's really what we're going to be studying um today. Uh in terms of those judgments, Don, did you want to expand on that in terms of the the yeah, the only thing I would add is is the the instruments of God's justice are these things called God's four sword judgments, and we touched on you know we gave an overview of it, which is the sword, famine, pestilence, and beasts, and so we need to understand the symbolism behind those things, right? Um, and that's what we're going to do now. So today we're going to start with the sword, and then we'll go on and and along all four, and we'll see what the what does the Bible have to say about that. And ultimately, is it fair? Is it just that God uses the sword? Is it fair that he uses famine? Is it fair that he uses pestilence and beasts to kind of correct our actions? All right. Um, you know, going back to your, you were talking about the positive and negative effects of, of a, ju a judgment. If somebody goes in front of a judge and they are found guilty of murder, right? They murdered somebody and they all the evidence pointed to it. And, you know, even the guy, let's say that the person says, I'm guilty. Okay, I'm guilty of this murder. The minute that the judge passes sentence on that person, it's to punish them for their behavior. But there is also a reprieve from society. Why? Because now you have one less murderer that you have to worry about. Does that make sense? So it's positive in the sense that society should be safer and it's negative for that individual due to his own actions. And that's what we're gonna notice here. It, our actions lead to these judgments, okay? And- Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna mention as well that, you know, on the example of a court case, right? The truth of the matter is that 100% of us, if you're watching this, you are guilty, I am guilty, we are all guilty. We are all on the guilty side. And the way that, you know, we, are not in the guilty side, basically, is if we accept the fact that Jesus paid the penalty. And so ultimately, that's what's that's what we're talking about, right? Are you accepting the gift? And if you accept the gift, there's absolutely no way that your life cannot be transformed. It just happens, right? And so it's not a matter of acting your way into being on the right side. It's about ac accepting the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. And then living your life in praise to him for the rest of your life. That's all Amen. it is. That's all it is. It's not about us working our way into that right place. We can't, period. There's no way we can do that, right? But when we, when we understand the sacrifice that was made and we appreciate the sacrifice that was made, we do absolutely everything in our power to not hurt him anymore. That's just the bottom line. And so our actions are simply evidence of our choice. Our actions are not trying to buy salvation. Our actions are simply evidence of the choice that we've made to allow, to, to accept Jesus's gift of saying, I paid the price. And that therefore, when we're stand, standing in that court hearing, are we guilty? Absolutely. But what God sees is the blood of Jesus covering us if we accept it. And that's and that's the bottom line of everything we're talking about. All right, I'll go ahead and pray to start us out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here once again. Thank you for the messages that you gave your prophets um, because you don't want us to be caught unawares, Lord, and you give us fair warning of, of things that you know will hurt us and hurt others. 
and how you give us the other way on how we can actually, you know, live lives uh, of selflessness that we can, uh, you know, show others who you truly are. Lord, we're going to continue to study and, it, and it's deep and it's heavy, but we pray that you give us the humility of heart and you open our eyes and ears to what you want to speak to. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, so here once again is our, can you hear me, Donnie? Yes. Okay, I'm just sure you didn't lift your head up. All right, so here's our methodology as we always go over it. Um, you can pause it, read it, and then go back and watch the video that, that describes all these things. So now we're going to just do a, a quick overview of what we discussed last week. We, we did that in the introduction. One of the things I want to touch on is that the purpose of these four sword judgments is not necessarily to correct individual behaviors. It is for God to correct the group's behavior. Okay, it's a collective judgment. All right. Like I said, um, in, in our previous session, and, and as we continue the study, we're going to we're going to hit on some of these stories. There were moments where God set an individual justice. OK, you get a plague of 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 a disease right then and there, an individual. OK, there are other moments where God says, OK, I'm going to give you the option of some, of these four sword judgments, which one do you choose? Okay. So God typically doesn't use all four at the same time. All four at the same time or in very close sequence means it's at the threshold of, okay, this, this is not going to go well anymore. All right. Why is that? Because it's designed to be gradual. Okay. Gradual. I will give you something easier up front. It's not going to be comfortable for you, but if you continue down this path, it's going to sequentially get a lot more difficult. Does that make sense? All right. So one thing we need to understand also is that the punishment meets the crime. And as we study today, it, it'll, it'll be more apparent what I mean by that. So the first one we're going to talk about is the sword. Okay. Now the sword really is societal conflict. All right. When we think of the sword, and we'll see it here in a second, it, it has to do with typically things that are internal to your organization or things on the periphery. All right. So we can think of it as localized. Okay. Localized conflict. This isn't something that would be global in nature. This would be skirmishes uh, in regions, for example. All right. Conflict, strife and persecution that does not result in our complete overthrow. All right. So it means that whatever it is, whatever group I'm in. All right. If I continue down this negative path. God's going to put these these friction points. In our path. All right. But it usually isn't something that's going to completely cause us to disband. All right. What he's hoping is that one or, or a couple of people within that group will kind of I see this and be like, kind of like that. There's many texts in the Bible that talk about being a watchman and be a watchman, be a watchman, be a watchman. He's hoping somebody in that group is a watchman to see what's happening and hopefully direct the rest of the group back into good order. OK, back into harmony with God and with each other. So. Again, this does not result in us completely going away. So we can think of this as military or ethnic skirmishes or ideologic, uh, ideological issues. Okay, like I am on the left wing, therefore everyone on the right wing I hate. Conversely, everyone on the right, I'm on the right wing and everybody on the left wing I hate. Okay, Ideolo ideology. So these Not that we've ever seen any of that recently. So with that, you have um, uh, religious also. My God is better than your God, so I need to conquer you. All right. That type of mentality. All right. And it, 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 so whenever you have the military 
you know, military just basically means truly means political, right? Because it's it's politics that moves militaries or ethnic skirmishes. All right. I don't like your face. <laughs> all right. I haven't liked your face. I don't know why I don't like your face, but we've hated your face for millennia. Does that make sense? So we we ethnically hate each other for some random reason. So these are the things that m motivate strife, right? But the key thing is this, temporary and localized. This isn't, again, like something like Nazi Germany in World War II. They went away. There's no more Nazi Germany. Does that make sense? But it may be uh, something like, uh, uh, you know, Vietnam, right? Vietnam's still there, all right? That's an example. I'm not, you know. Don't, don't throw don't quote me on this, but I'm just giving an example. The autonomy is diminished, but it is retained. Okay. So I don't know if you remember in the last video, I said it very briefly, but I want to bring it up again. God gave us the freedom of choice. But when we prove that we are not using our freedom of choice well, and the evidence of that is how much our choice is hurting others. Does that make sense? He's going to start restricting our choice. Okay? So, it's diminished, but retained. So, what does the sword really mean? And we're going to look at it here when I click the just. We don't want God's protection or peace. So he relinquishes us to those who threaten and cause us strife. Is this fair? Is this just? Why? He's giving you what you want. Okay, so let's look at what the Bible has to say about the sword. And this is the premise that Paul gives, right? And, and there's multiple places in the Bible where it says, there is no partiality with God, which means this, God doesn't play favorites. As much as we think, that there's like, oh, God picks and chooses. He's good, he's bad, he's good, he's bad, he's good, he's bad. Multiple places in the Bible says God is not partial. I don't pick my little favorites just because. I pick my favorites because of their willingness to give me back their choice. And that means surrendering our will to God's will. When we do that, he's like, that's someone I can work with. All right? So let's look here. Go ahead and read Colossians 3.25. But he who does wrong will receive for the wrong which he has done, and there is no partiality. Okay. So an example would be what the Old Testament describes as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So we see in the Bible that it's like, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. This is exactly what Paul is saying, just in a different way. All right. Now, where before we were under a theocracy, and God allowed for the eye for eye and tooth for tooth, we are no longer under theocracy on this earth, but if we're a member of the kingdom of God, who is our king? God. Who is our judge? God. Who has the right to punish? God. Okay? So, when it says here, receive the wrong which he has done, is it for us to do that damage, or is it for God to do that damage? God. Okay. So now we're going to read some stuff about the sword. Go ahead and read this. Job 19.29, be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishments of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Okay. So, what brings the punishment? Wrath. Of the sword. So if we are angry, we are going to receive... Anger. Does anybody ever come at you with a sword laughing and smiling saying, ha ha ha, just going to poke you a little bit? No. If they're coming at you with a sword, it's to end you. Okay? Does that make sense? But it was brought about by the, orig the original offender. Does that make sense? All right. Let's keep reading. Psalm 37, 14 through 15, the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay those on the upright path. Their sword will enter into their own heart and their bows will be broken. All right. So this is again, now this is David speaking. 
What is he saying? Evil people draw out their sword, and what do they do? They're... Basically, they're oppressing those... Who are they are oppressing? The people that are on the right path. Ah! What did I say when we started our, the entire style, uh, Revelation series? What happened to Jesus will happen to us. And this is saying that, right? Why did they slay Jesus? Because he was on the upright path. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now guess what happens? Woe to those that are on the opposite side. Woe to those who hurt God's people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Don't be on the receiving end of what you dish out. Whose sword is it? Their own. Ah, we'll see this. See, as we continue studying, we'll see this. Go ahead and read this. Isaiah 3, 14 through 15, the Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. For you have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean that you beat my people to pieces and grind, grind the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts? Okay, so this, what I, we're going to read next is in the same chapter, okay, just later on, because it's a chiastic structure. So this is the entering argument, where God is saying that the elders and the rulers of the people are doing what? Taking advantage of who? His people. My people. Keep reading what the end result is. Isaiah 325, your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty in the war. Okay. So here they are stabbing themselves. Does that make sense? They're a part of Israel. Israel is oppressing Israel. Israel is causing strife for Israel. Does that make sense? So he's like, you're stabbing yourself. So how about we use a real knife? Does that make sense? Let's keep reading. Hosea 11.6, the sword slashes in their cities, consumes their oracle priests, and devours because of their own counsels. So what was the reason that the cities and their priests and false prophets were being destroyed by the sword? Because of their advice. Their what is their advice in this previous chapter? Oppressing God's people. Okay. So who actually says hurt these guys? They do. People that claim to be speaking for God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I say, because I'm in the position that God told me I'm in, you need to go. You need to give me your money. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. And so God is saying here, okay, you want to attack your own people with a sword. I will send a sword to your door. All right. Keep reading. Jeremiah 15, verse 2, it shall come to pass if they say to you, where should we go? Then you shall tell them, thus says the Lord, those destined for death to death, and those destined for the sword to the sword, and those destined for the famine to the famine, and those destined for the, ca for the captivity to the captivity. All right. So now, this is actually something that we're going to read next, <laughs> is, is the, what, what Revelation's quoting from. Because remember, Revelation is the master's thesis of the rest of the Bible. It is the checksum of how well you understood the rest of Scripture. So here we see those who lived their life with a sword, okay? How will they meet their end? With a sword. With a sword. So now we're going to read in Revelation. And this now we're getting into God's justice, okay? You did all these things. So now I'm going to give you those same things that you gave out so readily. All right, so go ahead and read this in Revelation now. Revelation 13, 10, he who is to be taken captive into captivity, he shall go. He who kills with the sword, with the sword, he must be killed. Here's a call for the patience and the faith of the saints. So going back to, is this fair? Is this true justice? Yeah. 
yes, this is God's justice. He doesn't mince around with gray areas and plea bargains and appeals and all this other nonsense. When you get to a certain point, he will say, okay, you want the sword? Give you the sword. Right? Read this. Numbers 20, verse 18. Edom said to him, you will not pass through me lest the sword I come out against you. So this is an interesting story that happened when the children of Israel were finally like at the cusp of the promised land. And oh, by the way, the Edomites were related to them. They were distant cousins. Did the Edom Edomites want them to even come near them? No. What did they threaten them with if they even came near their territory? A sword. The sword. Let's see what happened to Edom in the very next chapter. Numbers 21, 24, Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon to Jabbok all the way to the children of Ammon because the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Okay. So what did they get? The edge of the sword. They wanted the sword, right? So what did they get? The sword. The sword. Interestingly enough, the children of Israel didn't even want their land. All they wanted to was to pass through. We want to go from point A to point B. But the Edomites were like, there's too many of you. We heard what happened in Egypt, right? We don't want you near us because we feel threatened by you. So because we feel threatened by you, what did they do? They threatened back. They said, I will kill you with a sword. And therefore, they ended with a sword. All right? Let's read this in Genesis. Why is this so important to God? To use the same means to punish the people. Go ahead and read this. Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of, of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. All right. So does God prefer that he is the one that does the punishment? What does he prefer? That... Almost like we kind of figure ourselves out. Our crime is against humanity, right? So who is he going to try to use to correct that crime? Humanity. humanity. Have you noticed that there's only a couple of times where the Bible literally says, and the Lord fought for them. And when God does, you can't mistake it. It's things like um, Fire the entire... Yeah. Fire coming out of heaven. Sodom and Gomorrah. That's God fighting for you. All right? That's God literally saying, okay, I'm going to do this now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We, in the military, we don't like fighting fair. We don't. We do everything in our power to not fight fair. Why? Because we don't want the enemy to win. Does that make sense? There are, yeah, there are laws. There's, there's laws of Geneva Convention and all this other stuff of how we should fight, right? But ideally, we don't want to fight fair. God is trying to allow us to. <laughs> He's like, okay, you guys need to sort yourselves out. You know why? Because you're not in covenant anymore, and neither is that guy. So if you're not in covenant, and he's not in covenant, why should I interfere? Does that make sense? I protect those in covenant from those out of covenant. But if you are out of covenant and he's out of covenant, I'm not going to get in between you knuckleheads. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So God prefers that human beings that start a fight have other human beings that end it. Because if he steps in every single time, it's a big deal, right? Now we're going to read something interesting in Revelation. We're going to go a lot deeper into this later, so don't get too bogged down with it. But we're going to see how even the angels can see God's justice, all right? So I'm going to give you some very specific quotes about a woman and what she's doing, okay? And how God answers that, all right? So go ahead and read this in Revelation 17. 
Verse six, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. All right. So here's a key thing. This woman is what? What is her state? She's drunk. She's drunk. What is she drinking? The blood of the saints and the martyrs. All right. This is the backside of our little prophecy study. Or actually the, the front side. What happened to Jesus will happen to you. When somebody, and the, there's a term that we use, um, in the English language at least, when somebody is very violent, when somebody just can't help but destroy people through violence, sometimes we call them bloodthirsty. This woman is exhibiting a thirst for blood. Okay? This woman is bloodthirsty. So from what we've studied so far, what do you think would be a just punishment for somebody that is bloodthirsty? Bleeding out? No. When you want blood, what do you get? She's asking for blood. What is she going to get? Blood. Ah. So let's read the justice of God. This is what the angels are talking to God about. They're, they're telling God, this is what you should do. Go ahead and read this. Revelation 18, verse 6, render to her as she has rendered to you and repay her double for her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix a double portion for her. Okay. So she's saying, the angels are saying to God, right? She's asking for blood. Give her all the blood she can handle. Mix her a double portion. She wants blood? Give her all the blood she wants. Does that make sense? Now let's see what that means. Go ahead and read this. Revelation 6, 4 through 6. 16, I'm sorry, 4 through 6. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord, who is and was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It was, It is what they deserve. All right. So who is cheering God on? The angel. The angels. Not just one. A bunch of them. Okay. This angel is, is saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he's the one that actually pours it. But all the other angels are saying this. And what are they saying? You are right. Do you think the angels have been seeing everything that's happened through human history so far? How often have they seen God's people suffer at the hands of those that, that just want them to be hurt? Because, they're, because of their justice. Does that make sense? Because of their righteousness. Sorry. So here, you have judged these things. What the angel is saying is this. The punishment that you're going to give them is blood. Specifically, where? In the waters. What do we do? What am I doing right now with my water bottle? Drinking, Drinking it. it. So there's going to come a time where God says, Oh, you're bloodthirsty. I'll give you blood to drink. Does that make sense? All right. I brought this passage up just to nail down this concept because later on we're going to go over these 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 angels and the third because these have to do with the bowls of god's wrath all right so let's go back here is it just mm -hmm. all right let's look here god gives us what we asked for we want conflict so what do we get conflict conflict all right we don't want your peace lord we don't want your protection. We we got this. What is God going to say? Oh, you got it? Okay. You you got it. All right. Does this does this make sense what the sword is? Societal conflict. All right. Now, let's go to Oh, why is it doing that? Oh, well. Give me one second. Ignore all that. You didn't see that. All right. So next, we're going to go into famine. Now, famine. 
Do you think this might be a good place to stop? No, we got time. We got time because we're not going to go over as many passages because we already covered a lot of them. So, but when we're done with this, we'll finish. So, famine, we always think of it as famine as only being we can't eat. Okay, I can't eat. I can't eat. I can't eat. Famine, famine, famine. It's not just what we can't eat. It's scarcity of any kind. Scarcity of shelter. Scarcity of water. Scarcity of food. Scarcity of resources. All right? And what we see here is that it's a phenomena that hinders our ability to generate and maintain a steady income and food on our tables. All right? This can also result from any of the other instruments. Right? So, for example, um, in the Old Testament, it describes sieges on cities. All right? I mean, just through a study of history, we understand that. One of the biggest things with sieges is the people on the outside want the people on the inside to starve. The starvation, the famine, the scarcity had to do with a battle outside. Does that make sense? So it can be a cause, direct cause, because of another event, right? And typically it does happen. But it can also be just on its own. Where God introduces scarcity, and we'll find out why scarcity is a weapon he implements. Here's the other thing. Again, when we have a hard time to maintain a steady income and have a reliable food source, how likely is it that we are going to continue being the aggressors? Not very. Right? You can go to battle with somebody over resources until you run out of money. Or you run out of the logistics that provide food and shelter for your troops. And then you're going to be like, okay, pack up guys and go home because we can't sustain this. That's the other end. All right. So once again, it's something gradual that becomes more problematic down the road. You can deal with scarcity for a short amount of time, but we can look in the Bible, for example, with Elijah and, and Jezebel and, and Ahab and that whole situation. God told Ahab, he's like, there will be no rain for three and a half years. Okay? Until I, you know, you come back and say, we're good to go. Actually, he didn't even give him the time frame. Later on, we find out it's three and a half years. But all he did was say, you ain't getting rain until I come back here and God says you can have rain. All right? Now, imagine no rain for three and a half years. Right now, where we, you know, in the United States where we live, there's a huge problem with, especially on the West Coast, of lack of rain. Huge reservoirs are being completely drained. They're even finding like dead bodies at the bottoms of lakes and, and, and all kinds of stuff. They found in Europe, they found uh, uh, like ancient relics that were at the bottom of these rivers and lakes because they didn't even know it was there because the river level went down so low. So, and this is just what? A couple of months that we've been dealing with this. Now imagine three and a half years. Okay. Three and a half years of no rain. All right. What do you think that's going to do to an entire population? Scarcity. Especially in back then where these people were living in, uh, you know, agrarian societies, right? Where you need agriculture to survive, but you also have huge cattle um, pastures, right? You have bulls you have goats you have pigs you have sheep you have all kinds of stuff also where are they getting their water and what happens to your flocks when they run out of water okay so scarcity let's look at this we don't want god's providence so he relinquishes us to fend for ourselves is this justice yeah look at this Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Okay, so this is Paul basically going back to saying the same thing. What you sow is what you get. I don't know if it's in this one or another one where it says, You who sow the wind will reap the whirlwind. Okay? So let's read Leviticus. 
Leviticus 24, 19, if anyone causes injury to his neighbor as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Okay. Jeremiah 5, 24, they do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter, in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Okay, so who's the one that gives us rain? God. God does. Okay. Even yet, there's people that are trying, and I've seen some some uh, some articles describing how people are trying to seed clouds. Because in some places in the world, it's so bad that they're like, we need to figure out a way to make it rain. We can make it rain in our suburban neighborhoods by just hooking up a, you know, a hose to a sprinkler or installing a sprinkler system. And, ba -da, you know, we got rain. But what happens when the water that comes to the sprinklers is gone? All right. So what God is saying here is like, I'm the one that provides you rain. But people start thinking or taking it for granted. That's what it's saying here. You don't say in your heart anymore, it's God that's giving me this. It's nature that's giving me this. It's El Nino, a La Nina that's giving me this. Not understanding that God sustains all that and provides for all that. So once we start dividing our, 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 our allegiances between Oh, nature does it. We forget the one that put nature in its place and establishes the rules of nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. The creator God. Go ahead and read this. Zechariah 10 verse 1. Ask for rain from the Lord during the season of the latter spring rains and the Lord will make the storm winds and he will give them showers of rain and all will all will have vegetation in the fields. Okay, so this is just another reminder that it's God that's providing so we don't have scarcity. All right? Read this. Deuteronomy eleven seventeen. Then the Lord's wrath will be inflamed against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will not yield its fruit, and you will quickly perish from the good land which the Lord is giving you. All right. So what can he also do? He can... He can give the rain and he can stop the rain. All right. Let me read this. Second Samuel 1 verse 21. O mountains of Gilboa, may there be no rain or dew upon you or your bountiful fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled. The shield of Saul is no longer anointed with oil. All right. So once again, going here. Because of your specifically here when it's talking about Saul and his and his family. Okay. It's because they no longer followed God. In, in this point here, they were actually in, in a rebellious state against uh, David. Okay? So now, once again, we see, oh, you think you can provide for yourself. Now, let's, let's, let's go even further. Let's say I'm a sheep herder and there's a drought. Alright? Is the grain to feed them probably going to get more expensive because now grain is scarce because of the lack of rain. Okay. How likely is it that the sheep might start dying off? Right. All right. How is that going to affect my bottom line if I'm a sheep farmer or a sheep herder? I can now, it's more expensive for me to feed them. So here are dollar bills flying out the window. And now a bunch of them are dying. How much more money is going out the window? You don't get paid for dead sheep. You don't get paid for, for starving sheep when they're not even fat enough to sell a market. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So so the, the scarcity affects not just our food and, and, and all these other things. Right. But it also affects our bottom down, our bottom dollar. Right. Our bottom line. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip that one. So now here's Elijah. Go ahead and read this. James 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to natural passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Okay. So, who initiated this punishment on the Israelites during the time of Elijah? Elijah. Why would Elijah hope that this punishment would fall on Israel. Why? Do you know what was happening to the to the prophets during this time? 
they were being, isn't that when Ahab was persecuting or getting rid of all the prophets? Yes. Ahab listening to his wife Jezebel. She was the one that wanted to get rid of the prophet. He submitted to her. He acquiesced to her desire. And so a bunch of prophets were getting killed. Ahab became more and more idolatrous because his wife was more and more idolatrous and she practiced those things we described before. Fertility cults and worshiping Molech. What were some of the characteristics of those two things? I don't remember. Sexual slavery, temple prostitution, and child sacrifice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So at this point in Israel's history, the innocent or the, the righteous were being slaughtered. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And Jezebel would offer all these prayers to her gods for the rains to come. And they would actually kill. And there's many places in, you can read about uh, heathen or pagan religions that they would sacrifice people, okay? So the rains would come. So the harvest would be good. The, 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 the Vikings did this a lot. It's actually, like, well documented. They would actually, some of the people would sacrifice themselves, hoping that, you know, that they would have a good a fall harvest for the rest of the, the, the community. Okay? So, this is the type of thing that's happening. So, God is saying, oh, you want to kill the innocent, so your gods will give you all this stuff. Well, I'm the one that actually gives it to you, and I don't like this. So, you know what? Let them give you the rain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You want your gods to give you the rain and the harvest? Be my guest, gods. But when he looks around, there's nobody there because there are none. Okay? Read this. Isaiah 5 or 6, And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but briars and thorns shall come up. I will also command the clouds, and they, and they rain no rain on it. All right. So let's go back to our presentation. So is this just? Right? We don't want God to provide for us. We can do it on our own. Or our gods can do it for us. So what does he say? Okay. okay. You want it? You got it. God gives us what we ask for. We tell him that we can do it ourselves. So he doesn't intervene. You want? Okay. I'm not going to intervene anymore. I do intervene for your benefit. But you don't want my intervention. So I won't. And you get what you ask for. All right? So we'll stop it there. I think that's a good place. And we got through two of them. And next week, we'll, we'll hopefully, or the next time we meet, we'll get through the rest of it. So let me go back here. What did you get out of these two? What did you understand of the sword? And what did you understand of the famine? Well, both of them is basically what you said is like God simply gives people what they want. And if they ask for blood, he gives them blood. And if they ask for, you know, self, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If they ask for just let me deal, let me take care of it. Right. Then God's going to say, okay, I'll let you take care of it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the equivalent of being, so there's a difference between, uh, self-reliance Okay. And like a supreme, you know what? I don't need you. Right? You can get to the point where like, you know, I don't want to put you out. So I'll try to take care of it as much as I can. But when I need your help, I'll ask for you. That's not what the children of Israel were doing. They were saying, well, God, I don't really like your rule. And I don't really like you as, as, our, as our divine being that we worship. So I want a human king. And I want a uh, a deity of my choosing. So God's like, okay, your kings will bring you the sword. They're going to start a bunch of wars. They're going to take your sons and make them be soldiers in these wars. And when they die, what are your women and orphans going to do? 
What are they going to do for a living? Right? Now, they're going to starve. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so now you have the famine piece. So as a result of the king's actions, there's a famine. Not only that, but also that they're saying uh, one of the passages in Samuel where, where God is speaking uh, to Samuel of how the children of Israel wanted a king. They're like, we want a king, we want a king. And he's, he was telling him, he's like, you're, 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 they're going to take your sons to war, your husbands to war, and they're going to, basically, you're going to lose all that. You're going to starve because of it. But even if you're not at war, what they're going to do is they're going to take your wealth and they're just going to make themselves richer. All right. Which, again, by them taking your wealth through taxes, guess what happens to your money? You don't eat. Because you got to pay the king for his beautiful, lavish lifestyle. But I can't even eat a sandwich. Okay? Then the other piece of it is now the deity side. All right? I want to worship this god. It's like, okay, you want to worship that god? Let him sort you out. You're having problems with your enemies? Ask your god. You're having problems with the rains not coming because I stopped? Go ask your God. Let, let them do it. Okay? All right. Does that make sense? All right. Can you go ahead and pray to close this out? You're muted. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your... Um, your mercy in taking our punishment... Um, we want to thank you for that. And we want to honor you for that um, sacrifice uh, with our lives. And we want to be on your side. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.